Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Today we have a special episode. We sat down with Clyde Prestowitz, president and founder of the Economic Strategy Institute and author of The World Turned Upside Down, America, China and the Struggle for Global Leadership. He gave his take on China's digital currency ambitions, how the Chinese regime rose to global economic power, how the pandemic served as a wake-up call for countries doing business with China, and much more. Well, hello, Clyde. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So let's kick off with China's ambition to lead in the digital currency world. And what are some of the ramifications around that if China succeeds? Well, I think um, one of the things China wants to do is to establish the RMB as a major uh, global reserve currency, uh, perhaps even as the most important global reserve currency. Uh, and of course, also the uh, digital RMB gives the, the Bank of uh, People's Bank of China, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, greatly a strengthened ability to track transactions, essentially to know what you're doing with your money uh, at every moment. So it, it uh, really, if, if it succeeds and if China, were, if the RMB were to become the global reserve currency, it would have profound impact uh, on uh, not just uh, the currency markets, but all markets. <clears throat> So it sounds like also with that, there's a, a lot of privacy concerns that would come into play. Absolutely. Uh, people would, investors would certainly um, be concerned that the Chinese Communist Party would know uh, every cent they're spending and where they're spending. It. And so uh, even though the trade war seems to have died down a little, President Biden is following Trump and taking a more hardline stance against China and like keeping a lot of the companies on the blacklist and things. So how do you see that as playing out? Well, I think uh, I wouldn't say that the trade war has died down. If anything, I would say it has gotten uh, stronger. I think actually the Biden administration has uh, has taken steps, stronger steps or, or further steps uh, beyond those of the Trump administration. Uh, and particularly, what's I think very important is the uh, Biden administration was able to uh, have the Senate, uh, uh, the Congress, pass a bill uh, which will provide uh, strong financial, U.S. government financial support for key industries like the semiconductor industry in order to help them compete against China. I think that's a very strong step. And so, yeah, like the bill you mentioned that just passed, which some call the China bill, I think it's putting around $250 billion into helping America compete with China. Some are saying, though, that like the America relies a bit too much on China, especially for materials like rare earth minerals. And so in what ways can this bill help the U.S. compete with China? Well, part of it is uh, part of what the Biden administration is doing is a review of supply chains. Uh, and it is uh, taking measures to reduce the dependence of supply chains on China, to find alternative sources of supply, to develop sources of supply in the domestic uh, U.S. markets. So I think it's very aware of this over dependence on China. For example, uh, talking about resources, China is a major producer of what are called rare earth uh, products, which are important for solar panels and for uh, batteries. Uh, the U.S. has rare earth. We have plenty of rare earth in the U.S. I think also what the U.S. has been doing has been uh, working with Japan, with Korea, uh, with the EU to shift supply chains uh, away from excessive dependence on China and more toward internal dependence on free world suppliers. Some are saying the pandemic worked kind of as a wake up call for a lot of countries. And so now a lot more countries are trying to decouple from China. So how do you see that as playing out in the future? Well, I think the pandemic was a wake up call. 
China seems to be doing by using its economic leverage in a way to punish other countries who criticize China, almost in a way like reverse sanctions. So like I think that kind of shows the dangers of relying so much on China. And it seems like a lot of countries are realizing that. But what do you think countries can do to try and pull away? In the case of Australia, there has been discussion of forming a consortium of free world countries. So uh, China has stopped importing wine from Australia. Well, the free world countries can create a fund uh, to assist the Australian buy wine from Australia as a substitute for, for China. Now, in fact, I think it's interesting that although China has greatly reduced its imports from China, overall Australian exports have not been very much affected because the Australians have found alternative markets for their products, and some of those markets are countries that are sympathetic to Australia and trying to, uh, to support it in opposition to China. And yeah, you mentioned the word um, alternative market, but it seems in a way China is also kind of creating its own alternative economy since so many countries right now rely on China to get materials cheaper. So what are, I think someone used the example of uh, all these countries using China kind of like a nine lane highway. <laughs> so what are some ways people can, well countries can pull away and not just have one lane disappear? Well, actually I, I think uh in a way, China is is uh, forcing them to do that. Um, you made the point earlier about China expanding its not only its production but the industries in which it produces. So China, as you well know, is focusing on this idea of made in China. Well, if everything is made in China, that automatically means that there's no market in China for non-Chinese. And so I think many countries are beginning to think about shifting their supply chains out of China. Let's keep in mind that China is a huge exporter. It exports more than it imports. Uh, and so if countries can produce substitutes for what they import from China, they automatically will have bigger markets of their own and they won't be dependent on China. Some also say with like China's Belt and Road Initiative that that's almost China's version of NATO and it's like these big powers facing off against the world stage. So what are some of those ramifications? I think that uh, what we're beginning to see already is the countries like uh, uh, Japan and, uh, and, and Korea uh, and the U.S. itself uh, are creating alternatives to the Belt and Road. Uh, and they are also um, beginning to work with countries to explain to developing countries that the um, when, when they are importing and making wide use of Chinese products, they also are opening themselves up to surveillance and to being spied upon. Uh, and so there's beginning to be, I think, a a combined uh, free world movement to offset uh, this thrust of China. And yeah, you mentioned a lot of countries are now pulling out, but what do you think brought them to China in the first place? Is it when China joined the WTO or World Trade Organization back in 2001? Or like, what what launched China onto the world stage? Um, the, uh, the opening of the Chinese market to foreign providers going back to 1978, going back to Deng Xiaoping and the initial opening of the Chinese market uh, made it uh, possible for outside uh, companies out of China, outside of China, to come into the Chinese market. And because the Chinese market was potentially big, many companies were interested to go there to invest and to sell. That was the initial impact. And then secondly, companies in the U.S. and in Europe began to understand that they could produce in China and that the labor cost in China was far lower than in Europe or in the U.S., that there were no labor unions, that there were very uh, weak environmental restrictions, 
Now they're finding that uh, China has stolen their technology, has forced them to transfer technology, and uh, gradually is, uh, is crushing them uh, and pushing them out. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you hear the word decoupling, and, and often I'm asked uh, how America will decouple from China. But my response is that China is decoupling from the world uh, with its Made in China 2025 uh, program. It has declared that it wants to be decoupled. That's how it's progressing. Mm. And you mentioned how the the lure of China, in a way, was that it has all these low costs of production. So, how would the U.S. or Western countries combat that? Well, there are two points. One is that. China is no longer uh, as inexpensive as it was. Uh, wages have risen dramatically in China. China has had uh, substantial inflation. Uh, and so other countries, Indonesia, for example, the Philippines, uh, India, all have much cheaper labor than China. Uh, Vietnam is another good example. Second point, however, is even more important, which is that much of that labor-intensive activity has been automated. Uh, and so in the past, uh, Apple iPhones were assembled by people with using their hands. Now they're being assembled by machines. Uh, and the machines cost the same anywhere in the world. So the labor cost advantage of China has been disappearing. <clears throat> and, and many companies are moving and they're automating their production, in many cases, even bringing their production back to the U.S. or to Europe because of automation. <clears throat> right now, there's a, a lot of reports about big data and China using that on the world stage. So what are some of those issues? Well, big data is interesting. Uh, in order to be able to uh, develop uh, particularly things like artificial intelligence, uh, a lot of data is, is necessary. And so in a way, the more data a country has, uh, the more rapidly and, and effectively it can develop. Things like facial recognition and other artificial intelligence uh, uses. China, obviously, with a large population, 1.4 billion people, has a lot of data. Uh, and that is a big advantage in its effort to develop artificial intelligence. Um, what that means is that countries other than China, the US, the EU, uh, need to find ways to obtain a lot of data. And so there is a lot of information in the US. but. Uh, the EU and the US and Mexico and uh, Canada and other free world countries can also share their data uh, in order to be able to match the amount of data. Now, a very important element of this is actually the question of how far do you want to go? Because as you well know, China is using facial recognition to punish people. And, and to impose uh, control on them, as in Xinjiang and Tibet and other areas. I think the big question for the free world countries is how, uh, not so much how they're going to get enough data, but uh, to what extent they are willing uh, and want to engage in some of the uses of data that China is doing. And what we're seeing is uh, a kind of a, a backlash. Um, many countries that previously had been interested in buying uh, this kind of uh, uh, surveillance equipment from China have become more careful and, and less uh, enthusiastic because of the problem of civil rights and, and uh, and free speech and freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. Right, so you mentioned a lot of these countries are less enthusiastic about buying things, but aside from the human rights issues and things, what do you think really changed these countries' stands? 
Well, I think a variety of things. Um, I think one is that countries, uh, the the uh, experience that corporations, that American corporations, EU corporations, Australian corporations, the experience that they've been having in China has been changing. In the 1990s, they were being welcomed. The Chinese were hugging and kissing them. Yes, come to China, come to China. But in more recent years, the Chinese have been saying, well, we're going to make it in China, made in China, uh, and uh, imposing more restrictions, uh, subsidizing Chinese competitors, uh, facilitating the theft of technology. So I, I think, you know, the aggressive industrial policy of China and China's uh, clear effort to establish uh, Chinese dominance in a wide range of industries has sent a signal to corporate leaders and political leaders around the world that uh, maybe they need to be more careful uh, about how they're dealing with China and maybe they need to think more about how to protect themselves from uh, Chinese policies and, and, and Chinese coercion than they thought in the past. <clears throat> I think you mentioned it in your book too, The World Turned Upside Down, that the West really helped China achieve this power when by letting China join the World Trade Organization. And then a lot of people thought that by letting a more ca capitalist country bring in a communist country, it would liberalize China. But instead, China kind of flipped it and made these free markets less free. So in what ways has that played out in the world stage? Well, I think that's exactly right. The, there was a great, uh, huge dream uh, assumption on the part of the U.S. and much of the rest of the world that, that free trade and open markets would automatically lead to a more politically liberal and open Chinese political uh, regime. Uh, and that, in March of uh, 2018, the Economist magazine cover story said the West made the wrong bet. And that was, that was, I think, a very important statement because the Economist had been a strong supporter of globalization with China. And now the Economist was saying, oh, it's not working. The Chinese side was saying, well, we can do this free trade stuff, but that doesn't mean that we have to become more politically liberal or embrace democracy. And, and what we're seeing is Dung was right. Uh, Dung said exactly what was going to happen, and it did happen. And now the rest of the world is waking up to the fact that free trade doesn't necessarily mean political liberalization. And indeed, a country may save free trade but not really mean free trade. And that's what people are seeing with China today. So what are some of the ways China was violating the World Trade Organization and what these experts had been betting on? So the World Trade Rules uh, are intended to, uh, to limit uh, government subsidy of corporations. China was able to, on the one hand, um, drag its feet. It it, uh, it kept saying, "Yes, yes, we're going to we're going to change," but it didn't change so quickly. Uh, so it just it, it continued to provide strong subsidies to state-owned corporations and even to non-state-owned corporations. Number one. Uh, number two, um, China was. Under the WTO rules, uh, if a French company uh, wants to invest in China, it should theoretically, legally be allowed to invest and to produce in China without transferring any of its technology to a Chinese competitor or partner. But China was able informally to use pressure 
and coercion to force companies to transfer technology. Uh, you know, China has this uh, famous uh, torture known as the death of a thousand cuts. And corporations were subjected in a way to the death of a thousand cuts. So there wasn't any official statement, but maybe one day the water wouldn't run. Or maybe another day, uh, a state inspector would show up. Uh, there are all kinds of informal ways for a powerful government like the Chinese government to put pressure on a corporation. And so many corporations were subjected to that kind of pressure. Third element was that um, China would, uh, under WTO rules, uh, exporting countries are not supposed to provide particular financial help to their exporters, and exporters are not supposed to dump their products in foreign markets. So that means when they sell in a foreign market, they should sell the product at more or less the same price they sell in their own market, uh, not below their cost of production in their own market. But in fact, uh, in many instances, Chinese companies dumped their products in foreign markets, dramatically undercutting the uh, competing companies in those markets. Now, in the United States, there's a procedure. So if I have a company making, uh, let's say, uh, uh, solar cells, and you have a company making solar cells, and let's say my price is $10 a solar cell, you come in my market and you sell it for $5. And I complain. So my government will investigate you, and my government might find out that you're cheating. However, that investigation takes a long time. It takes a year or more. And during that year, you're taking all my customers. I could be out of business by the time the government makes its decision. And so a lot of that was happening. And for all those reasons, more and more complaints kept coming in through the World Trade Organization that China was not playing by the rules. China was cheating. Uh, but uh, the World Trade Organization moves very slowly, uh, and it's not able effectively to uh, uh, adjudicate all of these complaints. It's, it, the World Trade Organization does not have the power to compel China to play according to the rules. Okay, so now moving forward, how can the West continue to try and outcompete China? On the one hand, I think that they have to recognize that China is not going to play by the rules. Uh, and so they need to decide that uh, it's useless to complain about China, to go to the WTO and expect that something will change. So the only thing that can work is that countries need to be able to respond to China by applying their own domestic trade rules. Uh, and if China is dumping, they impose anti-dumping duties. If China is subsidizing, they impose anti-subsidizing duties. They have to take action. But the real, the real uh, issue here is not so much what countries do to China. It's more what they do to themselves. Uh, and you're seeing the U.S. has just passed this $250 billion uh, uh, law to strengthen U.S. Uh, high-tech companies. The EU is doing a similar thing. Uh, Japan is doing similar things. So all of these countries are spending more on research and development. All of them are looking at changing their supply chains. Japan has a program which uh, it effectively uh, offers a subsidy to Japanese companies if they move production out of China back to Japan. They've already doubled their budget for that program. Uh, other countries are undertaking similar measures. Uh, the Australians are beginning to look at alternatives to uh, dealing with China. So I think what you're going to see is more and more uh, movement of supply chains away from China, more and more emphasis on uh, technology uh, 
uh, collaborative technology development among the free world countries. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And for those just tuning in, that was Clyde Prestowitz, president and founder of the Economic Strategy Institute and author of The World Turned Upside Down, America, China, and the Struggle for Global Leadership. If you'd like to check out his book, the link is in the description down below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.